The Story of Redemption by Ellen G. White Chapter 51 The Second Angel's Message The churches that refused to receive the first angel's message rejected light from heaven. That message was sent in mercy to arouse them to see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding, and to seek a preparation to meet their Lord. It was to separate the Church of Christ from the corrupting influence of the world that the first angel's message was given. But with the multitude, even of professed Christians, the ties which bound them to earth were stronger than the attractions heavenward. They chose to listen to the voice of worldly wisdom and turned away from the heart-searching message of truth. God gives light to be cherished and obeyed, not to be despised and rejected. The light which he sends becomes darkness to those who disregard it. When the Spirit of God ceases to impress the truth upon the hearts of men, all hearing is vain and all preaching also is vain. When the churches spurned the counsel of God by rejecting the Advent message, the Lord rejected them. The first angel was followed by a second, proclaiming, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14, verse 8. This message was understood by Adventists to be an announcement of the moral fall of the churches in consequence of their rejection of the first message. The proclamation, Babylon is fallen, was given in the summer of 1844, and as the result, about 50,000 withdrew from these churches. Those who preached the first message had no purpose or expectation of causing divisions in the churches or of forming separate organizations. In all my labors, said William Miller, I never had the desire or thought to establish any separate interest from that of existing denominations or to benefit one at the expense of another. I thought to benefit all. Supposing that all Christians would rejoice in the prospect of Christ's coming, and that those who could not see as I did would not love any the less those who should embrace this doctrine, I did not conceive there would ever be any necessity for separate meetings. My whole object was a desire to convert souls to God, to notify the world of a coming judgment, and to induce my fellow men to make that preparation of heart which will enable them to meet their God in peace. The great majority of those who were converted under my labors united with the various existing churches. When individuals came to me to inquire respecting their duty, I always told them to go where they would feel at home, and I never favored any one denomination in my advice to such. For a time many of the churches welcomed his labors, but as they decided against the Advent truth, they desired to suppress all agitation of the subject. Those who had accepted the doctrine were thus placed in a position of great trial and perplexity. They loved their churches and were loath to separate from them, but as they were ridiculed and oppressed, denied the privilege of speaking of their hope or of attending preaching upon the Lord's coming, many at last arose and cast off the yoke that had been imposed upon them. Adventists, seeing that the churches rejected the testimony of God's word, could no longer regard them as constituting the church of Christ, the pillar and ground of the truth. And as the message, Babylon is fallen, began to be proclaimed, they felt themselves justified in separating from their former connection. Since the rejection of the first message, a sad change has taken place in the churches. As truth is spurned, error is received and cherished. Love for God and faith in His Word have grown cold. The churches have grieved the Spirit of the Lord, and it has been in a great measure withdrawn. The Tarrying Time When the year 1843 entirely passed away unmarked by the advent of Jesus, those who had looked in faith for His appearing were for a time left in doubt and perplexity. But notwithstanding their disappointment, many continued to search the Scriptures, examining anew the evidences of their faith, and carefully studying the prophecies to obtain further light. The Bible testimony in support of their position seemed clear and conclusive. Signs which could not be mistaken pointed to the coming of Christ as near. The believers could not explain their disappointment, yet they felt assured 
that God had led them in their past experience. Their faith was greatly strengthened by the direct and forcible application of those scriptures which set forth a tarrying time. As early as 1842, the Spirit of God had moved upon Charles Fitch to devise the prophetic chart, which was generally regarded by Adventists as a fulfillment of the command given by the prophet Habakkuk to write the vision and make it plain upon tables. No one, however, then saw the tarrying time which was brought to view in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, the full meaning of this scripture became apparent. Thus speaks the prophet, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. The waiting ones rejoiced that he who knows the end from the beginning had looked down through the ages, and foreseeing their disappointment had given them words of courage and hope. Had it not been for such portions of Scripture, showing that they were in the right path, their faith would have failed in that trying hour. In the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, the experience of Adventists is illustrated by the incidents of an eastern marriage. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet their bridegroom. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The widespread movement under the proclamation of the first message answered to the going forth of the virgins, while the passing of the time of expectation, the disappointment, and the delay were represented by the tarrying of the bridegroom. After the definite time had passed, the true believers were still united in the belief that the end of all things was at hand, but it soon became evident that they were losing, to some extent, their zeal and devotion, and were falling into the state denoted in the parable by the slumbering of the virgins during the tarrying time. About this time fanaticism began to appear. Some who professed to be zealous believers in the message rejected the Word of God as the one infallible guide, and claiming to be led by the Spirit, gave themselves up to the control of their own feelings, impressions, and imaginations. There were some who manifested a blind and bigoted zeal, denouncing all who would not sanction their course. Their fanatical ideas and exercises met with no sympathy from the great body of Adventists, yet they served to bring reproach upon the cause of truth. The preaching of the first message in 1843, and of the midnight cry in 1844, tended directly to repress fanaticism and dissension. Those who participated in these solemn movements were in harmony, their hearts were filled with love for one another and for Jesus, whom they expected soon to see. The one faith, the one blessed hope, lifted them above the control of any human influence and proved a shield against the assaults of Satan.